If you'd like to talk about your own Bigfoot encounter, or if you're looking for help from a Bigfoot investigator in your area, email me at bigfootcrossroads at gmail.com. Also, be sure to check out the Facebook page and give it a like at facebook.com forward slash Bigfoot Crossroads. Robert Dominguez is a veteran Bigfoot and paranormal researcher from Northeast Texas that I have known for many years. He has a great approach to the subject of Bigfoot, being open-minded while remaining grounded and professional, allowing the evidence to speak for itself. A longtime advocate for witnesses, Bob puts the witness first and the research second. He's been a part of some amazing Bigfoot investigations and has some fantastic stories from his years of experience. When it came to picking a first guest for the new podcast, my good friend Bob was the first person that came to mind. I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. Bob, thanks for coming on as the first guest of the brand new, kind of old, Bigfoot Crossroads podcast. Hey man, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's been a been a trip, been a journey. Yes, it has. <laughs> How long have we known one another? Oh, I would say since that's got to be like 2005 or six, right? Yeah, right around there. I was thinking uh, just a few years after I started looking into the Bigfoot mystery myself. How long have you been uh, Bigfooting? I've I've been Bigfooting probably since like 1999, 2000. Uh, 99 was whenever I first got. Uh, started in it because I was a novice and 2000 is whenever I joined the TBRC uh, with Luke Gross and I uh, was in, in it full, full deal, uh, holy field. So it was, it was full on, you know, doing research, going to the field, talking to people, interviewing people. So, so you just was, jumped right in with both feet. Yeah. Cause I didn't, I didn't know anything about Bigfoot. And then when I got, I was lucky cause I got under Luke Gross and Luke Gross is even to this day, he's, he's still a mentor to my, to, to me right now. And, uh, and he was, uh, I was like a sponge and I was just trying to gather as much information from him as, as possible. So yeah, I just jumped right in and, and it was really, really exciting to, to help start TBRC at, at that time. So let's, uh, go back uh to a place i like to take everybody uh, i like to find out their history and everything mm -hmm. whenever you were a little bobby dominguez mm -hmm. uh growing up in texas correct yes sir what kind of kid were you what what were you into i was i was i was into um at that time, I was I was into like you know like any other kid. I was into Star Wars because Star Wars had just came out. Uh, so I was into Star Wars. I was into uh, New Hope. Uh, I would think I was I was too scared of aliens, and so I was I was kind of like a science fiction nerd. Uh, but I was you know deep down I was always into like any like most of the kids like most people at my age they 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 got kind of thrown into the Bigfoot with uh, the Legend of Boggy Creek. Mm -hmm. So I was fairly, I was probably like six or seven when that movie came out. And I, I was just enthralled ever since I watched it. And it was like, uh, I I wanted to be a part of it. I don't know why. I was just, I was scared of it. But at the same time, I was like excited about it at the same time. So I guess, you know, I was a kid growing up. I was into Star Wars. I was into science fiction, but I always had that Bigfoot itch in the back of my mind. I said, you know, what if we could go looking for this, this hominid or this creature? Uh, and I used to talk to all my, all my friends and like all my classmates about it. So it was kind of funny. <laughs> so you've always been the Bigfoot guy. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so um, I think I'm, I'm on the podcast that I have. Uh, we always, I always talk about this guy named Michael Nunez and we always talk about me and this guy named Michael Nunez would talk about, Hey, let's, let's, 
whenever we get older, let's let's go to Canada and let's go look for Bigfoot. I go, yeah, let's let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> but like even like we talk now, so we, you know we should probably look for Michael Nunez, but you know who knows where he's at. <laughs> Perhaps in Canada. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's funny because I didn't see uh, Legend of Boggy Creek until I was already in the game, so to speak. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, my first, uh, I guess, run-ins with Bigfoot outside of the library was like uh, reruns of In Search Of, mm-hmm. uh, seeing the reenactments and stuff. But I can imagine as a little kid seeing something like Legend of Boggy Creek where, I mean, it's kind of a documentary style horror movie. It was. And, you, you know, grow, it was just kind of weird. And just growing up, because that was like my, my first uh, taste of it. And like, I, I, I'm sure, I've, you know, you and I are, are pretty good friends and we talk a lot. And I I grew up in a big family. I grew up like I was the seventh born. So watching TV, you know, watching In Search Up, that was not an option for me because like I I didn't have, you know, TV privileges growing up. So I had to watch pretty much what everybody else was watching. So when I saw Legend of Boggy Creek, it was like it was like a it was like a, a, a diving point off, you know, into the infinity of, of bigfoot knowledge and so it, i just jumped right in and that's for some reason i i stuck on that and i it, it always stuck with me because that was the only memory i had of it did you have uh urban legends and myths and stuff like that around your area growing up there was there was um there was um the was that i'm gonna i'm gonna probably spaz out here thinking about this one but this one is uh lake worth monster yeah the lake worth monster that was that was around our area that was like way before my time though i think uh my mom actually had um an incident of the lake worth monster and so a lot of people thought it was a goat they called it the goat man yeah but, yeah but, i have heard that reference but really, it's, it was really like a Bigfoot. I mean, most people that, if you go back and look at the Fort Worth Star, uh, Fort Worth Star Telegram uh, notes on that, or the old clippings in the 50s and the 60s, and I think you're going to come across that most of the people who describe it, is, it to me, it sounds like a Bigfoot. And um, But that was in my area growing up. But I, to be honest with you, I didn't hear about it like, like you. I didn't hear about it until I was older, until I was actually in the field doing Bigfoot research and I had heard the story. So I went back to go look at it. I said, but I, if, if I was had that story when I was a kid, oh man, I would have, I would have freaked out. <laughs> there's a pretty famous photograph of the Lake Worth monster. Yeah. Uh, the one that they printed in the newspaper have, has that ever been debunked to your knowledge? Um, I don't to my, to this day, I don't, I'm not sure. Um, I know, uh, there was some people like in the TBRC that, had talked about it all the times and I don't know why no one ever really questioned it or or talked you know or try to debunk it or go to that area I think everybody just kind of gravitated toward East Texas so it was just one of those things that, okay that that sparked that sparked us onto the Bigfoot journey so let's go look for Bigfoot so no one's ever really talked about it so you saw Legend of Boggy Creek it stuck mm-hmm. with you I'm not gonna age you or anything (laughs) but there was a gap there yeah (laughs) how uh, so what motivated you to finally be like you know what i'm doing it um you know just like anybody i was i was at work i can actually say this i can say like the place i worked at because i don't work there anymore but i worked at sprint corporate real estate in farmer's branch and uh, it was actually the first office job I had where I, I had the internet. So so I was like, I took advantage of it. So I just typed in the word Bigfoot. I, and actually, I, I take it back. I typed in the word Texas Bigfoot. And what popped up was a picture of Luke Gross. And like I was saying before, Luke was at the, I think it was the the 11th annual Bigfoot conference in Newcomerstown, Ohio, run by Don Don Keating. And so there was a picture of him at this conference and he was wearing a cowboy hat. And 
it was it was shown him and uh, I think I think it was uh, Craig Wilheater, and it was talking about and it had his email address on there. I don't know why, I don't know why it did, but it did. And I emailed him. I emailed him. I said, "Hey, how does one how does one contribute to Bigfoot here in Texas?" Because I just wanted to see if I could get someone to respond. Because like I think at the time I had I had uh, emailed the BFRO to see if I could contribute with them before I went out to looking for, you know, looking up Texas Bigfoot. I never got a response. So I reached out to Luke and he responded like within a week. And I think he was in Missouri doing a Bigfoot case with Buddy Britt. And he said, hey, I'm going to be in town next week. I'll call you and we'll talk. And I said, okay, I don't know what we're going to talk about because, I mean, I didn't know anything about Bigfoot at that time in 99 and so he, he reached out to me like a week later and we talked on the phone for four hours and I was just trying to listen as much as I could, learn as much as I could. And he was telling me, he goes, hey, we're actually forming a, a Bigfoot group here in Texas. Do you want to be a part of it? And I was like, you know, my my mouth almost dropped. I go, yes, of course, <laughs> I, I, I would love to. And I go, I don't know what I can contribute, but OK. He says, no, just come out. So. Uh, we end up forming that that Bigfoot group like late late ninety nine in December uh, in East Dallas at Craig Wool Craig Woolheater's house. So it was twelve of us, and so once once he got because like Luke's he can he can motivate he can he can do a, a good you know pep uh, speech pretty good. Yeah, so he's he, like a he talks like a coach. <laughs> he does. <laughs> he's he's almost he's almost like a like a East Texas. Captain America. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so he 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 was like he was like um telling me that I can contribute. It doesn't matter. And la- that motivated me. I said, okay, I'm I'm in this. So I drove to this guy's house in East Dallas and my mom was up so upset because she didn't know where I was going. I was going to I was going to some stranger's house that I found on the internet and we're Who chases meet. Bigfoot? Who chases <laughs> Bigfoot? <laughs> so so that was that was that was my start into into the texas bigfoot research center so and then the rest was history after that so so there was a guy uh a rich oil man by the name of tom slick uh, yes down in texas who Mm -hmm. uh funded a lot of research endeavors uh for bigfoot and the yeti Mm -hmm. um you know paying the best of the best providing the equipment you know the airfare all of that sort of thing uh to the you know far reaches of the world Mm -hmm. but i never heard anything about tom slick actually focusing on texas you know i think we talked about this on my show and um that you know that to me that boggles my mind it just boggles my mind how he did not know that there was there was yeah. locals, you know, in East Texas and like the big thicket. And he was going halfway around the world. And I think I think he actually funded some stuff in the Pacific Northwest, too. Yeah, I think so. Um, but to my knowledge, uh, especially uh, hands down, whenever it comes to modern Bigfoot, mm-hmm. I mean, Luke is the godfather of Texas Bigfoot, as far as I'm concerned. Yes, I, I, you know, because like he, he, you know, he was with another group, and I'm not gonna say the group because I don't want to, I don't want to push them. Um, he was with another group that's kind of like in Texas and Louisiana, and then he left that group and formed TBRC. And before, I recall before that, like in '99, whenever I typed in Texas Bigfoot, no websites came up at all, nothing. And maybe the GC did, GC BFRO and. Um, but, but that was about it. And then after Luke formed TBRC, you know, a lot of other groups start po- like popping up like years later. And it was just like, it was, it was just like he start. I'm not saying, you know, he's, he's the reason why, but after he formed TBRC and we, we got well known a little bit like in East Texas and then other groups started popping up. Cause um, I'm sure there was other groups that wanted to join our group. And we had like a, um, we had a hold on membership for a little bit. And so I'm sure people start, you know, started joining or forming their own groups after that. So it started popping up like a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, stumbled across, uh, Bigfoot very similarly through the internet 
and that was back, uh, you know, 98, 99, same time right. frame. Yeah. And there wasn't that much out there, but within the next couple years, there was just a huge boom of groups and websites dedicated to Bigfoot. Yeah, because like we, whenever, whenever, because like we're, we pretty much did almost, uh, almost like discovered Bigfoot almost at the same time. And uh, I was, I was like, I was looking up on, I can't think of the name, but it was like, it was like GeoCities and it was like e groups. And there was like another one. I can't think of it. It's like Fire something. I can't think of it. But it had all these groups, these different groups that are like chat rooms and stuff like that. And I'd always look for like Bigfoot stuff. And those back then, those, those were hard to find. Yeah. So, so whenever you first got into this, mm-hmm. what did you think? Uh, uh, I mean, in regards to Bigfoot actually existing, did you think right out the gate like this thing is real? It's here, or what, did you think it was? What What were your very early thoughts and beliefs whenever it came to the subject? I, you know, whenever we formed TBRC, I was I was just in it. I said, okay, this is going to be a group, kind of like a like a book club, you know. We just we'll just get together and we'll just talk about Bigfoot and that's something I like to talk about. And then we started talking about like outings and like I said, you know, I was thinking to myself, I never said it out loud. I said, "There's no way Bigfoot's in in like East Texas or Texas. There's no way at all." And I didn't I didn't even think about. It. I said, you know, they want to do outings. I said, "Okay, let's go camping." Okay, that's cool. <laughs> so <laughs> so we end up we end up going to uh, I think the Sulphur Springs and there was a couple. This is lady's property. I can't think her. I can't think of her name, but it was this lady's property. We went out, and she lived right on this gas right away in Sulphur Springs, and I think it was right near Jim Chapman Lake. Um, so um, we were on this lady's property. It was like most of us from TBRC, and we were sitting there, and Luke was you know sitting there with us, and it was like real late at night, and she had a bunch of dogs, and all the dogs were around us, and um, friendly she had like five or six dogs and luke was telling us hey um this thing's gonna come around around you know three or four o'clock in the morning it's gonna let us know and it's gonna leave and then come back around five or six and i go okay sure so we're just sitting there talking and around three or four o'clock in the morning um the dogs go under this lady's house and you know we hear like a big like it's not to me it's not like a shotgun like pow and then it was another one, pow. Then another one, pow. And I go, someone's shooting. And Luke leans over to me and he says, no, nope, that's that's the Bigfoot letting us know he's here. And I go, what does that mean? I go, okay. So, and then later on, you know, it leaves. The dogs come back out. And about five or six o'clock in the morning, the dogs go back under the house. And then we hear like a behind us, like a big piercing yell. And it seemed like it went on forever. It was like, and it like the the further it went, the louder it got. And like my my chest was vibrating, like really really bad. And I go, I mean, it, it almost sounded like a whistle, like a like a train whistle, like you were standing right next to a train. But it wasn't a whistle. It was you can tell it was like an animal, and whatever it was was letting us know. And, he, and Luke like leaned over to me and says, "He's leaving now, so it's just letting us know." So. The next morning we woke up, <laughs> you know, we woke up and then we walked over to where we thought were these, these, you know, these uh, loud bangs were coming and we walked over to these trees. It was like a, it was a cluster of trees and they were, they were all bodar trees. And if you know bodar trees, those, those trees are really dense, really mm-hmm. hard. And uh, this thing was walking along this, this tree line and it was reaching up and it was twisting. It wasn't breaking off completely. It was just twisting these branches about eight feet up. And, uh, and it was pretty thick, about three or four inch diameter branches. And I looked up and then I looked down. Luke was pointing to the ground. He says, there's no trucks coming through here. So this tells me that this was a Bigfoot walking around, uh, you know, an alpha male, you know, showing it's, a, you know, that he was the, the most dominant person here. And I looked up at that and that scared the crap out of me. I said, man, this is real. I didn't see it. But I heard it and I looked up. And there's no way that something can twist that without like a opposable thumb. No way. So then I knew that this was real that moment. And the dog's behavior changed completely. 
completely i mean i can i can just imagine <laughs> what must have been running through your mind yeah uh at that moment you know whenever this guy tells you hey this is going to happen <laughs> and then this is going to happen and then it does yeah so I, I i can't explain it like you know most of the time whenever i go in the woods or also like most of the times i did like research with tbrc or in any stuff that i did like while i was independent there's you know there's been areas where you go to and it's pretty dangerous and it's pretty scary and and I've been, you know, I'll admit I've been scared on some, you know, some of the outings and some of the places I've gone. But every time I'm with Luke, I'm not scared. I don't, I can't explain it. I don't know why. But I, I always start going, well, Luke's here. Everything's going to be fine. <laughs> so, because he, he knows whenever they come around. So, <laughs> so, so whenever Luke. that happened, I mean, were you just like picturing like the creature from Boggy Creek out there snapping the tree limbs or what? Pretty, what? pretty, pretty much. And then I was looking. I, I was I was thankful I wasn't like in a bathroom, you know, <laughs> doing a number two while this thing was out there, because so, <laughs> it would have reached in and grabbed me like a like a tree branch and just broke me. So now that you've been doing this for eons, <laughs> how have your uh, thoughts and beliefs on the creature changed over the years? You know, when um, whenever we first started in '99, um, you know. Luke had the idea and he was, he was a great teacher and he was, he had, he had the idea of this thing was flesh and blood. And, you know, we didn't, we didn't cater any other theory after that. I mean, once we started the group, that was, that was our deal it was flesh and blood. So anybody that came to us and talked to us about portals or spirits or um, the Bigfoot's changing into like a, a changeling or something or morphing into something else, we just shut it down and we didn't think about it and said, no, you're wrong. And that was whenever it first started. So <clears throat> I, I left the group in 01 and 2001. And, um, and I started doing a lot of like, you know, independent stuff. And I was like, I was free to do a lot of stuff because whenever you're with a group, like, especially like, like TBRC, you, you're only allowed to do certain things. You're only allowed to do certain, uh, experiments and you're not, and so you kind of like limited on doing stuff. So once I left and started doing other stuff, I started doing as much as I could, trying different things and then talking to different people. And I think whenever I left, I talked to a lot more people. I talked to a lot of uh, Native American groups and uh, cattle groups. And I just started hearing what people had to say. And like after, after I've gotten older and most of the experiences I've, I've had, there's some, there's some things I've, I've, I've experienced that I cannot explain. And, for the life of me, I'm I'm just a little bit more open to it. So um, I used to not think that, and I know when I say this, I don't. It's not my core belief, but I'm open to it. You know that the Bigfoots ha may have an, uh, like an opportunity to to uh, read your mind or, or or talk to you psychically. I mean, I don't. That's not that's not my view, but I'm open to hear people talk to me about it or portals or uh, these things can these things can change into uh, a beaver or a raccoon or whatever. So I, I like in the past I used to shut it down, but now I'm more open to hear about it. So I don't, I don't try, I try to listen as much as people as I can, like in the field and, and people want to talk to me about it, then I'll, I'll listen to them. And I don't, I don't judge people anymore. I don't, I don't do that. So I want to help people that's seen this animal. And so like, there's some people who've seen the animal Matt that they can't cope with it. And so they don't have a, a voice or, or avenue like to talk to. So I want to be that, that conduit to do that. So, so I'm more open to a lot more other stuff that this, you know, this creature is not flesh and blood. I think you have to be. Yeah. Uh, at least to continue, you know, in this endeavor, um, it's something you and I have talked about, you know, before, mm -hmm. um, I think that's where a, a big part of the mistake happens. And it's something that I did for years myself, not realizing that you can be open to it without knowing or thinking that that's how it is for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, because it came down to the point where I just thought about it 
you know, I don't talk about my sighting a lot because it's weird to tell somebody that, you know, you've seen Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. And the reason that it's weird is because most people don't believe you. Yeah. But then I know that. (laughs) And for years, somebody would tell me something crazy that they supposedly observed in regards to Bigfoot. And if it didn't fit in my beliefs, I would just write them off. Right. So I was doing the same thing to them that I don't like done to me. It can happen. Yeah. Whenever we actually don't know, none of us know. Right. No one's experts. Like, like I said before, I've had some experiences that I cannot explain. And, um, so I'm actually more open that they're not just flesh and blood. They could be, they could be spiritual or they could be, you know, they could be, uh, I mean, cause no one ever talks about this and I know I've talked to you off show about this before. Bigfoots can have ghosts. I mean, what's, I mean, if humans can have it, a Bigfoot could have it too. So, I mean, who knows? Maybe people who see a Bigfoot actually see a Bigfoot ghost. I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's, I'm not there. Uh, I've, you know, I've never seen one. I've heard lots of stuff, but I've never seen one. But uh, I've been to tons of, you know, a bunch of states and been to a ton of areas. So, are you comfortable with talking about some of your strange experiences? Um, we can talk about it. Some of the some of the stuff that I was doing when I was um, an independent guy, I was with I was I was with some other colleagues, and we were on this guy's property. And we were we we're doing a ton of experiments on this guy's property. And um we were we would like we would get like uh tires and we would put them on like through trees. Like we had this one tree that didn't have any branches, it was just like one big long tree. And we had we had cut all the branches off and so we and it was like maybe ten feet up, you know, we would get a ladder and we would put these tires like down this tree. And we would we would color we would spray we would spray color like the the bottom one to see if a, if a bigfoot would notice it, and sometimes we wouldn't get it and you know and so you know we had the idea of 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 peeing on it so we peed on it one time and or all of us did and like the next time we came back out the next weekend the whole tree was pushed over, and so so I kind of it kind of started us on this ex, like this experiment to do stuff so. We would we would go on this guy's property and we would walk like we would walk all all over to this guy's property and I would take off my shirt it was all sweaty and I would stick it like in the crack of a tree and I would you know he he had a bunch of he was growing a bunch of stuff too he was growing like cantaloupe and and corn and stuff so we would get like a like an ear of corn and we'd walk into the woods and stick it in like under a log or something or put it you know behind a tree or something so we would do that a lot. And then, and when I would, when we would sleep, because we would sleep on like in tents on this guy's property. And then when I would wake up in the morning, I would find like rocks, like a stack of rocks outside our tent. And they were like stacked, like, like almost like, um, like someone went out of their effort to stack these rocks on top of, you know, on top of each other. And then they would leave like, um, herbal, herbal, herbal stuff out for us. Like, you know. Uh, like mints and stuff from the woods, like flowers and dandelions and stuff like that. So it was kind of odd. And then we would have all this stuff, and then um, we would notice that they would like leave sticks out too, and these sticks would would be in a pattern. And and I would look at, it, go, is that a pattern? And we would all notice it. And at first, we would just think there was a bunch of sticks because you know, if you're a Bigfoot researcher, you run into stacks of sticks all the time, or branches stacked a, a weird way like no no storm would ever do and so after we looked at it a couple of times um one of the guys point out that they thought it was it was sticks that were in ogham and we looked at it kind of strange and i said no there's no way there's no way it's that and so i think i think he was one of the guys was doing some research on ogham after that and started noticing much a bunch of stick patterns and he would he would say that most of these 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 sticks were in Ogham and they were leaving signs to us. And then after that, I think he kind of freaked out and he didn't want to go research anymore because he thought this thing was communicating with us. And 
I never looked into it. I just, I was just there as an observer. So I thought it was kind of odd. And it was one of those things I cannot explain. So we were like in this area and, and nobody was this, it was private property. So no one would go on this guy's property and leave like stick formations in a Ogham type of, um, you know, verbiage or something. So it was just kind of odd. And Ogham's like a ancient Druidic secret language, isn't it? It is. So that was, to me, that was kind of spooky. And I, <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't know what to take of it. I didn't, we didn't log it down and we didn't tell anybody about it. I've never told anybody about this. I think you're the first person I've actually told about this. So, um, it was just odd. It was, it was kind of hard to, it was just kind of hard to, um, digest. And then like, I think like a week later, cause like we were putting out game cameras and we and like after a while, you know, back then, Matt, you know, you know, game cameras were kind of expensive. Yeah. And, you know, we had like three or four and that was a lot for us. And then like someone had a, a, a camcorder that we would just go out and just stick in, you know, in trees and stuff like that. And so we used to, we didn't have, we didn't want to do like walkie talkies or anything like that. So we would just shout to each other, like in the woods, you know, Hey, are you over here? Hey, are you setting this up? And, uh, one of the guys, um, I'll just say, you know, his, his name was buddy and we used to shout buddy in the woods all the time. And so whenever we were like recording on these camcorders, we would go back and like look at the footage and hear the audio. And there was a, it was a point in time where somebody was yelling the name buddy and it didn't sound like one of us. And like, again, like I said, this guy was had private property. Nobody, nobody was allowed on this guy's property. And so somebody was yelling buddy in the woods and it sounded really deep and it sounded really like almost like a growl type of buddy, you know, and, and that really freaked him out and he didn't want to come back and, uh, come on. And uh, it kind of freaked me out a little bit too. So, so it was just kind of odd that this, I don't know what it was. I'm not going to say it's Bigfoot, but you know, I don't, I, I don't know. I can't explain it. So <laughs> that's one of those things I can't explain. And we were researching in the field. We were yelling this guy's name. It was maybe mimicking us. And so, and there was like another time where I was sleeping on this guy's uh, sleeping, like in the tent, on this guy's property and right next to his property was like a, this other farm that had horses. And in the middle of the night, I had woken up, you know, to go do the business and I came back in into the tent and I lay down and I could hear a horse like in, like in a distance, like, you know, doing his, <laughs> and at the very end of his, of his, of his yell, it would go. Urgh. And it just, it just kept doing it like throughout the night. And I go, okay, <laughs> there's something, there's something out there mimicking a horse. And so I had, you know, those things that I've, I've had, have, I've had happened to me and I cannot explain it. And I didn't, I wasn't recording at that time and I kind of wish I did, but, uh, some of the just stuff that just happened, I just, I can't explain. I know for a fact that there's Bigfoot in this area, the one I'm, I'm talking about. And I just, I just can't. Most of the stuff that we caught on this guy's property, you know, I can't use. It's not mine, so I can't use it. So I just let it go. And, uh, like, for instance, the the horse sounds that you're talking about, this was while you were camping out there, like, in the middle of the night? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. if somebody, we'll just say, for whatever reason, mm-hmm. were trying to hoax you, yeah. They wouldn't even know if you were awake or not. No. No, and it's like um we were we were in the middle of this guy's property and it was like we were kind of we were kind of far from the road and um we were in the woods and we were kind of far from the road and so you you had to know where we were at to do it and um the areas where that we came close to the road there was like the I mean cuz he had a he had a, a neighbor that had a farm but it was, you know, his the his house at the farm setup was further down. It was really further down, so you couldn't really hear a horse that far back. And so uh, the 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 point where we were camping and the where the road was, it was kind of far off. And then the his house and then the the rest where he kept his horses were further back. So it was no way 
Unless you know someone was like riding a horse down <laughs> down the road or something, but uh, I kind of doubt it because you you could hear it because it was a uh, it was a pave it was half of it was paved and half of it was it was dirt so it was just odd. Where all have you uh, researched at? I've researched um, I've researched um, some you know most of my stuff is in Texas. I've done some in Oklahoma, of course you know that. Uh, I've done a little bit in Louisiana with Todd Partain. Uh, and I've gone up to Smokey Crabtree's house in Arkansas, and he showed me a lot of areas where he was like would go out and go uh, noodling and stuff like that. So I've been there, and then I've gone up to Ohio, Newcomers Town, uh, for the Bigfoot Conference there, and I went to the field with uh, Don Keating, Mark DeWorth, uh, Eric Altman, and a lot of other a lot of other guys. I think um, I can't. I think it was Larry Lund uh, was with us. Uh, Mike Frizzell with the Enigma Project. Um, and I want to say Monty Ballard was there too, but I'm not sure. But anyway, I've been there. I've been to Oklahoma. I've been to, I've been to uh, North Carolina uh, numerous of times. And I've been out there, but I've never seen any, any big, I'm sure there's Bigfoot stuff, but I never saw any. So, but, um, but those are, those are the, like the main areas that I've gone to. You mentioned Smoky Crabtree. Yes. Uh, for people who are unfamiliar, uh, the legend of Boggy Creek is pretty much about the Crabtree family's experiences. Yeah, and if you know, bless his heart, he's already passed away, and I'm I'm glad I had the opportunity to meet him. But if you were to talk, if when he was alive, if you talked to him about that, oh, he would get, he would, he would turn red, and that's that's just a sore subject with him because, uh, which I'm sure I'm sure you know. Yeah, but what what was it like for you though, <laughs> meeting Smoky Crabtree? It was man, it was like it was like because like um, like I was like you know we, we were saying that if like the legend of Boggy Creek was based on his family and it, it it didn't say Smoky but it said the Crabtree family, so I just assumed like whenever I first met him I I assumed that he was a part of it and I said I love that movie. And he handed me a shot glass. <laughs> he handed me a shot glass. He says, "Oh man, I don't want to talk about that movie." So, uh, but he didn't. He invited me up to his house, and we went up. We drove up to his house in Falk, and uh, he showed us like a big skeleton. I when I looked at it, it looked like a panther. Like it was like a it was a big skeleton of a looked like a big cat with no head and no tail. And he had it like this big glass thing, and he was he swore up and down that it was you know it was it was a critter, the real um, deal. Yeah, it was a real deal. But when you looked at it a bunch of times, and I, I'm sure I have pictures of it, I I, just, I have to look for it. But uh, it it looked like a a panther. That's what it looked like, and it was like it was a big cat. It was huge, and um and then he took us inside his house, and he had this huge huge hornet nest inside his house. Like it was like, it was emptied out and it was like hanging over his, his fireplace. And it was, it must've been about at least about, Oh, I say like six feet wide and about wow four foot tall. <laughs> and it was, and it was huge. And I said, what is that? He says, Oh, that's a, it's a hornet's nest that I, you know, I had when I was a kid and I just kept it and I <laughs> hung it over his fireplace. So I thought that was cool. And I go, okay, cool. And then uh, he walked us to the back of his house, and in the back of his house, he's got a pond, uh, a catfish pond. And uh, we walked back there, and he he walked me to the very edge of the of this because he built like a pier that goes in, you know, to his pond. And he had this like silver trash can that he would bang on it. And as soon as you bang on it, it's just like like hundreds of heads would pop up out of the water. And he handed me a cup, and I would like you know I'd go in this trash can that had this feed, and I would just throw it in the water, and you could see all these catfish. I thought it was neat as heck, you know. That I get to <laughs> and then later on that day, we he took us uh, he t- he took us to the bottoms, and we walked around. And he was wearing um, his fishing pants, and you know, and we we're walking around and looking at stuff. And he t- and after that, he he took us to the Monster Mart, which I thought was great. So the famous Monster Mart. Yeah, I have a picture. I'm sure I'm sure you've seen it. It's like me like flexing in front of them with the monster. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, that was that was great. But uh, I'm actually I'm actually friends with his son on um, on Facebook, and I, I call him Smokes. Where is your favorite place to Bigfoot after you've been to all those different places? Um, 
I would say I did a lot of my stuff. There's like two places I did a, like the majority of my stuff at, and it's like uh, Lamar County. Pat Mays Lake area is where I done like predominantly most of my stuff. And then uh, I'd like to go up to uh, Moyers, Oklahoma. And there's a little, a little area of the, of the Kiyomichis that I'd like to go up there. And I've had a lot of experiences up there. So um, Moyers and probably, uh, which I think is Pushmataha County. Pushmataha. Pushmataha. And, uh, and then Paris, Texas, which is, um, uh, Lamar Point. So that's th- those are two areas I like to go. And um, recently on the podcast that I'm that I'm doing, um, there's a there's a story I've been doing like three episodes on, and this one guy had an experience in Longview. So that's my next place. If I were to go back in the field, that's where I want to go next is Longview, where this guy had this amazing story of this aggressive Bigfoot. So. That's where I want to go next. There's a lot of stories of aggressive Bigfoot in Texas and Mm -hmm. uh, Oklahoma as well, uh, where I'm from. Uh, What are your thoughts on that? Do you think that Bigfoot are dangerous or are they, you know, the gentle giants of the Pacific Northwest? You know, the the guy, the guy that I was uh, referencing back to our our podcast, um, he was a uh, he was a wrestler and um he's a big dude and he claims that he wrestled Andre the Giant you know Andre the Giant's a big guy yeah i think he's like i think he was uh maybe 72 i think i can't the remember eighth i can't wonder remember of the world yeah he was like close to 600 pounds so he was a big guy and he said when he saw this thing this thing was like two Andre the Giants like you know side by side that's how big this thing was and aggressive he was and so when he had this this encounter he said this thing he thought he calls it a monster and he thought he was going to die and this thing like you know it it shadowed him out of this area and so he was telling me that he, he's had like you know a, a bunch of night terrors throughout his life since he had this and this i think was in 97 and he's had it since then and so uh when i was when he brought this story to me i was talking to him about it he hadn't talked to anybody else but you know you know, but me about it. Didn't tell his wife, didn't tell his son, nobody. And so I was talking to him about it and he was asking me why he thought this thing was so aggressive. And I told him, um, cause he was on, he was en route with his brother-in-law to this river. I think the, the Sabine river to go get these fish traps. And so this thing came out and it was very aggressive toward him because that was his food source. So uh, later on, like in the story, uh, whenever they didn't go back out, whenever this thing sh- shadowed them out and they left, they went back to the next morning and this, this Bigfoot, you know, we're assuming that it went out and took all this fish off this fish trap. So I was explaining to him that this was his food source for his, I go, he's probably a monarch for his family. He's, he was, uh, he was trying to provide for his family. And he, he didn't think of this to this day that this thing had a family that had, you know, had young, you know, young offspring or nothing or uh, or just anybody like like to provide with and so he just thought of it as a monster and so i told him i said if this thing wanted to kill you it would have but it didn't it shadowed you out so i think i i think to answer your question to you know whenever you hear stories about bigfoot being aggressive it's usually because they don't they don't want that person or these people in this area and so they try to drive them out and so i've i've maybe heard two stories in texas where a Bigfoot act. No, I'll take it back. Three where Bigfoot touched somebody or knocked them down or pushed them or was aggressive to them, and it was mostly for, from what I heard, like these stories, they were, they were like a like a defense type of mechanism, and it was like again, it was in the way of their of their food source. So that's what I think about it. But I don't think that they're they're that aggressive, and they may appear to be aggressive, and you know, a lot of people will probably argue about that, but. I think it, it, I think they're 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 gentle giants, and if you don't if you if you don't leave the area, it will. So they'll probably, you know, thrash trees and you know scream and you know uh, sway back and forth and get you to get out of there. And once you you start moving, they're gonna they're gonna shadow you out. And then, but if if you were to stay your ground, that's my theory. If you, if you stand your ground, these things would would, would probably leave. Well, you'd think over the years, uh, as many people that go out there, 
uh, provoking them and studying or trying to study them or have a sighting or whatever that if, like you said, if it wanted to hurt the guy, mm -hmm. they're certainly capable of doing that. I, I would just think that something would have happened to a Bigfoot researcher. Yeah, they would go missing or they'd be like in pieces or something. So, I mean, you do have, uh, you know, rumors and stories that pop up every now and then, but nothing yeah. confirmed, nothing yeah, uh, that seems to be like a uh, pattern to their behavior like that. Absolutely. Uh, what's your favorite experience you've had? Um, let me see. I think one of the most favorite ones I had was I was in Moyers, Oklahoma. I was with uh, Ken Marvel. Ken Marvel's a, a Bigfoot researcher that I was with in TBRC, and then we left uh, almost at the same time. And uh, he had some property up in Moyers, and um, we, you know, we we're in the Kimichi Mountains, and they, they call it a mountain, but it's really like a big hill. And so, so he had this he had this property on top of this mountain, and he had um, he had said that. Uh, the owner of the property had dammed off this creek to to build a dam, so so people that were camping on that hill could go down and fish. So he wanted to go show me. So we we're walking down uh, this property, and it was like a it was like a real narrow path, and it was like a, it was windy, and so it had just rained that night and that morning. Uh, there was like there was it was it was it was pretty muddy, and it had like puddles of water everywhere. So as we're walking down, I was looking down at the at the puddles of mud and 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 just trying to see if I could see footprints. I didn't see any at all. So we walk all the way down. We go to the we go to the to the dam, and then uh, we we pick up this this smell of like a really like a like a it smells like garbage to me, garbage and like um, body odor all together. You know, just like almost like a skunk. And so we smell this big whiff and then like there's a tree line on the other side of the, this, this dam and we could hear it. We could hear somebody grunting really, really loud. And uh, it was, it didn't sound friendly at all. And it was like, rah, rah, rah. And it, was, it just, it was kept getting louder. And I said, okay. So we stood there for a little bit and it just, it just kept going and getting louder. And, and then uh, we, 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 heard some like some trees shaking and stuff i said okay let's i think we probably probably need to go so we end up leaving and so we were going up uh this trail again and as we we're going up this trail um this trail was going straight up and then it was kind of windy a little bit but you could see and some of the like the mud puddles there were now footprints um and they were pretty big footprints they were probably like around 13 14 inches uh and and some of these mud puddles, Matt, it had a like half a footprint in, and like the rest of it was in water, like a like a mud puddle uh, with water in it, and the and the water was still moving. So, I looked down and looked at that, and I I was telling Kenny, I said that wasn't there before, like in the so, same in the same mud puddles that you had just looked at. Yeah, yeah, we had <laughs> just looked at. There weren't there weren't any there. So, as we're going up this trail, this 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 footprint was like going in, in the direction of crossing the path, not going up the path or going down the path, but crossing the path. So whatever this was had circled us really, really fast, or maybe it was multiple ones. I don't know. And uh, that's probably like the best experience I had, you know, cause I, I heard this grunting at us and I've, I've heard stories about it and I've never had it happen to me. And then this happened to me. So uh, there's like a handful of other ones that I, I've had, but that one was the most like, the most it, it it just seemed like it had just happened and we had just missed it because that like I said that mud puddle was still moving, um, but you could see like the footprint in it. So was there still like floating sediment and stuff from the footprint? Yeah, you could you could see you could see the where the water had moved. Like you it know, hadn't even settled yet. It hadn't even settled yet, and you could see like toes, and you could see like the back heel was was in the water. Like you could see like toes on it. Um, and I, I didn't, ha I did not have a camera with me at, at that time and it killed me. And, um, and so, um, that had happened and like, we just, we went up the hill and it, it didn't want us by that dam. So we left. So, so as, as I was leaving, I shouted really loud. I shouted, okay, we're leaving. 
If you put together a Bigfoot bucket list, what all would be on it? Who would you research with? Where would it be? Well, I would say this. I would I would want to go back to the great state of Oklahoma and research places with you. Oh, you're too kind. <laughs> I don't know how much of a bucket list that is. <laughs> well, if if we're talking outside the box, I would say I would have I would I would have loved to meet John, John Green. I would have loved to meet uh, meet him and um, probably Rex Gilroy in Australia. I like to go to Australia and look up the Yowie. The Yowie. Yeah. So I'd li- I'd like to do that. Uh, Rex Gilroy was a guy that I I got in contact with in '99, and I don't know if he's if he's around anymore. I don't know if he's still alive, but he was he was pretty he was an older gentleman at that time, and he was the only guy I was talking to about the Yowie, and he would like send me like articles and photos and all kinds of stuff. And I would, I would have liked to gone back and maybe done some stuff with him. You know, you hear the word Yowie and people roll their eyes. I get it. Yeah. And it's Australia, you know, it's a giant Island. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if there's going to be a place where these things exist, Australia is the place, you know, look at, look at the animals that are already there. Yeah. I mean, I mean, they, they, I think most, most of that continent is like, like Bush. So, I mean, yeah. why would it not be there? I'm, I met Rex on, I think it was GeoCities that I met him on, on a group, on a Yowie group. I, I met him, I met Rex uh, Giroy on that. And like, I used to always post, I always to ask questions and he used to always like respond to me. And then he asked me for my email. And so we just started trading emails. And I think once I left the uh, TBRC, I, I lost contact with him. So. Do you have a favorite uh, Bigfoot story or report? The the one I was telling you about before uh, that I that we have uh, showcased on uh, my podcast, uh, Bigfoot Club, was the is the Longview story, and that was probably um, the one I. This guy brought me a story like I think like six years ago, and I've always been enthralled by it. And so this gentleman, like I was telling you before, he had he was a wrestler. And he had this this aggressive Bigfoot come out, and uh, it came out and uh, you know showed itself to him and his brother in law. And his brother in law was telling him before he had got there that, that he had a critter problem, but he didn't he didn't say what it was. He just said, "I have a critter problem." And so when they went out to go talk, because he was talking to his brother in law about getting a job or something, they were walking to the to the to the Sabine River to go get their their fish, and this thing came out. And was very aggressive. So when he when he first told me the story, he said this thing stepped out of the woods. And when he he told me that, I said, "Hold on, stop right there." I said, "Did it rock back and forth?" He goes, "Yeah." I go, "Did it show you its teeth?" He goes, "Yeah." I go, "Did it scream?" He goes, "Yes." I go, "Did it grab branches and start you know like shaking them around?" And so he goes, "Man, where he goes? Shit, man, were you there?" <laughs> and I go, "Continue, go." So he was telling me about it. So he he said he only saw this animal like six seconds worth maybe and he says what always what always grabbed me about the story matt was he told whenever he said this whenever he told me the story he said when it, it walked through a briar patch like was nothing mm-hmm. like it like it like it this, like like these thorns didn't even bother it and just he says that the the woods swallowed this thing up he said it was so massive that that blew his mind away that this thing was so massive. It was like 200 giants and it was like big. And it, it said it moved so quickly for something that big. He said it looked like it was floating. So when he told me that, that the wood swallowed it up and that it was floating, it looked like it was floating, that it, it just, that story just like, it, it got me going. I said, man, I haven't researched in a long time, but when he told me the story, I want to go back and research. So, so most of the stuff he was telling me about it, you know, I was telling them, I go, I go, did it, did it follow you out? He goes, yeah, he goes, we could see it like in the tree line. He goes, I couldn't see it fully, but I could see like the top of its head or I could see trees moving as we're right. Cause I'm sprinting as fast as I can. And this thing was just toying with us. And it's like it, whenever they finally made it out of the woods and made it back to this, this guy's trailer. And then that's when you could still hear it screaming. But you know, that, that story to me, and I've had a lot of stories like, you know, I've, you know, investigated a bunch of stuff, but that story recently has got me more than anything. 
As a researcher, what do you think the uh, most important type of Bigfoot evidence out there is? You know, I hate to say it, and I've won- I've never been part of this this group to do this, but it's going to have to take a body. And I don't really want. I don't really. I hate saying that, but it's going to have to do it because, like, most of the people that are looking for this this creature are just a bunch of novices, and like you know, myself and and people just a weekend warrior people, and they and they. It's to me that's not enough. I mean, you, we could we could research all we want, and we can document you know harder than anybody else, and videotape much. As we, but science is never going to accept it until you have a body. And I hate to say that, but that's what it, that's what it's going to take for people to realize or uh, classify this animal as a species. So that's that's me. That's interesting that you'd say that. Um, you're also you've got one foot in Bigfoot, but you've got the other foot in the paranormal world. I do. So I, to hear you say that it's going to take a body for Bigfoot, uh, what would it take for the paranormal community? <laughs> um, That one, that one's tough. That one is, you know, I tell people this because people ask me this question all the time. What's more scary, paranormal or Bigfoot? I mean, I would always say, I go paranormal because like Bigfoot, you can just go home. <laughs> if, <laughs> if, if, if the Bigfoot's bothering you, you can just go home and you're okay. But paranormal, you can actually take stuff home with you and uh, stuff can get attached to you. So uh, paranormal wise, man, I don't know. I mean, even if you, even if you catch, if you catch a lot of video of uh, shadow people or, or, you know, uh, aberrations and stuff like that. I mean, it's uh, to me, I don't know. I mean, a lot of people catch a lot of good stuff, but people don't accept it. A lot of people, they just won't do it. And I don't, I don't know why, but that's really a tough question. It's hard to answer that one. So with that being the case, and like you said, you don't like the fact that it will probably take a body to prove Bigfoot, but that could very well be the case. Mm-hmm. So what motivates you to continue this? You know, uh, and I know we've talked off show about this a lot and you, you, you know, you and I, we have, you know, a lot of conversations. Um, whenever, whenever I was in the, the TBRC, when I first got in like in the TBRC, when Luke, uh, recruited me, I was, I was in, in the documentation side. That's all I wanted to do. But then, the, you know, there was, there was, there's aspects of the TBRC that I won't get into that I didn't really like. And I didn't really like it. And so I didn't like its direction where it was going. And I, I got to a point where I just wanted to help people because like there was, there was like a couple incidents because like we would, we would take turns like taking on the website over the weekend. And if we got sighting reports, one of us would uh, try to respond like really, really fast to people. And I got, I had a couple, I had a couple incidents in uh, Lamar point where I had whenever that's why I, that's why I'm kind of close to that, that region. But I had a couple incidents where this lady reached out, to us and she was she was devastated and her husband didn't believe her she had she had two little girls she she had reached out to the sheriff the sheriff then didn't want to listen to her and she had no avenue to go to ask for help and so i was i was like her like she i think she she messages like at three in the morning and i called her at 3 30 and she was frantic and she didn't know what to do she didn't know where to go she didn't she didn't she was at on her last straw. So I was like pretty much her, her only, only way to, to solve this or just reach out to her. So I talked to her for a couple hours and I assured her that we were going to be out and I told her what to do. And um, so just helping people, you know, educate them on this animal on what, what, you know, what the animal does, why it's there, you know, why, why is it coming by or, you know, how come I saw this and when I was hiking and I, you know, try to give people as much information about it and just kind of help them through. So to me, that, that kind of drives me a little bit like to do that, just helping people. There should be more people out there with that mindset. There should be, but I know, uh, having an encounter, uh, the, the impact that mm-hmm. it has on you, on anyone, I mean, it's a life-changing event. It really is. It is. And for some people, uh, that's not always easy to handle. No. And it's just like one of those things that I, 
And I kind of look at that way on the paranormal side as well. So, I mean, on both sides, I all I want to do is just help people. And people that reach out, because people still reach out to me right now on paranormal. But if, if someone were to reach out to me on Bigfoot, I, would, I wouldn't hesitate. And, I mean, I haven't been in the field in a while. But if someone reached out to me right now, I would go out and help them and see what I could do or educate them or show them uh, why why this Bigfoot comes by or why it's... Well, it sounds they, like you still are helping people. I mean, you were talking about the guest you had on a Bigfoot club right. from Longview. Uh, think about the difference. Uh, it makes just to transition the thought process from yeah a monster that's out to get me to a creature trying to provide for its family. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I guess I, I guess I could have used that one again because uh, he, I mean, he was having night night terrors for a while, and uh, I think I think talk because like I did three episodes on it, and then uh, the third episode he actually came on and actually talked to us, and I was kind of surprised, but I was happy because I wanted to help him, and uh, he was having like uh, some uh, night night terrors about it. I think actually I'm not, you know, it just it didn't it didn't help his marriage, you know, whenever he had that. I'll, I'll just say that. And, um, cause I don't want to, I don't want to dwell too much on his personal life, but, uh, it didn't help him. And so I think him talking about it to me, cause we talked about it like six more times. And I think I recorded one of them and, uh, I think, I think just walking through it and talking to them about it and just helping them why he saw this thing and why it came out. And I just ex- explained to him what happened and I assured him that nothing was going to happen to him, but he, he didn't believe me on that one. So he says, because I asked, if I asked about going back out to the area, he does not want to do it. So I don't blame him. And I said, no, you shouldn't. If that's not, you don't want to do it, then you don't, you shouldn't have to. But I want to go out there. He says, well, you're crazy. And I said, okay. <laughs> but that's, that's like, you know, getting like a Bigfoot to respond to you that way. That's a Bigfoot researcher's dream. Yeah. So, um, you know, people might think I'm crazy, but I would, I want to go out there. I want to go out there and experience the same thing he did. So. You've handled a lot of different uh, investigations, working with groups and independently and everything. Uh, what are some of the more memorable investigations that you've participated in? And like, what are the differences you hear between witnesses about their encounters with these creatures? Um, I think, you know, the way the way TV is now and the Internet is now, like as because I think whenever whenever I first got into Bigfoot stuff, it was the Internet was just taking off. It was just, you know, starting to go DSL and start start going a little bit faster. So more people started um, knowing more stuff about Bigfoot. So more more information was able to reach people faster. And so a lot of times um, whenever I was doing stuff with the TBRC and uh, when I was, you know, solo, um, you, you kind of get those kind of those sighting reports where um, I call it TV saturation where people tend to watch a lot of TV and, and kind of mimic whatever people say. Cause like when someone comes up to me and say, Hey, I saw Bigfoot and I, you know, I normally ask for their address and I look it up to see what part of East Texas they're at. If it's, if it's, if, if this area could actually, you know, sustain a Bigfoot and stuff like that. So I look at stuff like that. And so, you know, to answer your question, um, being as, you know, I'm not saying I, I know everything, but you know, after you talk to, you know, a hundred people, you kind of, you kind of get to that point where you say, okay, this, this area could sustain a Bigfoot. They might've seen one. And then you get some that there's no way they could like see a, a Bigfoot in this area. There's no way. So, that kind of taught me that, you know, doing the, like the different like uh, independent stuff and the TBRC stuff. So it it's it just one of those things that I don't know. TV, I think people just want to be heard a lot of times, and a lot of times you just ha- you have to be careful on what you research. And like I try to talk to everybody, but at the same time, I said, man, there's no way you, someone could see a Bigfoot in this area because there's there's too many homes. There's not enough you know, coverage, there's not enough creeks or lakes to, to, you know, to sustain a Bigfoot. So hopefully that answers your question. What do you think those people are looking for? Just the attention? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, cause you, you know, you kind of get it more on like on the paranormal side, but, uh, you get it every now and then, like on like the Bigfoot side and people just want attention that they, they want to, they want to be heard and 
talk to and that's fine but i think some of the guys in the tbrc didn't want to they didn't want to talk to people like that and i i always said you know when i was with them i said you know we got to talk to everybody and that's just how we you have to do it because you can't pick and choose who, who you're going to talk to because it it's like a it's like a learning curve you know when you go out and talk to somebody and they say they saw bigfoot and you try to prove it or disprove it and so in the same way with like paranormal so yeah you, you have to talk to people and you got to be able to see what they're what they're seeing because you, you you never know how, what you know who or what you're like dealing with when it comes to like a eyewitness person they could be and i i don't judge people i don't do that at all so i, I just want to i just want to help them and just kind of help them guide through it so there is a huge uh surge in the online bigfoot community due to the popularity of the finding bigfoot show yeah i always saw finding bigfoot as kind of the uh ghost hunter show of bigfoot you know yes. like the taps crew mm-hmm. did you see a surge in the paranormal world following the popularity of ghost hunters coming on the air oh yeah that's that's where i termed the phrase uh tv saturation was from that <laughs> i mean because do you think like- these kind of shows help making it like does it help in the sen- sense of uh, people are more willing to share experiences where they wouldn't have before I, you know, I, yeah, I think so. I think it kind of helps people, uh, you know, probably more so, like I said, probably more so on paranormal to reach out to people and, and like to be heard and stuff like that. Because there's a lot of, cause I used to be, I used to be the case director for paranormal investigations of North Texas. And I, I I'm actually still running the group, but the, our group's not active, but, um, I've had a, I had a bunch of cases where people were watching TV and they were, I go, that actually sounds like a ghost hunters episode. And, and then, you you know, we would go through the motions and, and, you know, have them, you know, sign papers and, um, and then research the area and then like, you know, stay there like the night and go through audio and video and we wouldn't find anything. And I said, okay, this is another one, but you know, you, like, again, you, you never know what you run into. You have to do the research and you have to, you have to put boots in the ground just to, just to make sure. So, I don't know why. I don't know why people do it. They they just tend to do it. And um, but yeah, there was there was a big surge of that. And um, I I always took all the cases, whether I thought they were real or not. I just try to I just try to help people. And and you have to do it because you, you got to learn. You got to learn from it. You got to learn from your like like mistakes and 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 just go with it. So uh, here recently. It's kind of taking a back seat to all the normal, horrible chaos that goes on in the world. But uh, the United States government has finally come clean and admitted that, hey, yeah, there's something flying around out there that's not quite human. Right. Uh, You know, which to me uh, is a huge deal. They're admitting to UFOs uh, on some level. Uh, The reason I think that's a huge deal is because my entire life I've been waiting for it. Yeah. And it's always been deny, deny, deny. Absolutely not. There's nothing out there. Yeah. So it goes to show that the government will hide stuff. I think everybody knows that. Do you think that the government is covering up Bigfoot knowledge? Yes, I, I, I think so. And I um I talked about this, I think, on another podcast, but um I I'll say this because they they asked me that same question and I and I said, um, Back when I was with the TBRC, we used to we used to go to an area in Silver Springs we called Area Two, and it was it was it was just an open area over by Jim Chapman Lake, and whenever we would go down this one this one uh, road, a game warden would just show up, just automatically just show up like he knew we were there, and so I think after a while we figured that they had put like a a road trigger there, like a little sensor. And so every time a vehicle went by, they would come out. And I think, uh, I think I had a buddy of mine that was a retired constable and he had, he, he had his old radio still. And he would tell me, he would call me and he says, Hey man, are you in town? And I go, yeah. He says, uh, cause the walk is going crazy. They say that you guys are in town. And I go, really? <laughs> so, so they would, they would, they would talk on the radio that we were, we were in the area. Big footers are in the area. So they would come and try to question us and try to get us out of the area. And eventually, the 
I think the state or the federal government ended up buying that area that we were researching. So we were no longer accepted there. So we had to move to another area. So what kind of things would they say? They would ask me how, how come we were there? Who were we? And they were checking with to see if we had any weapons and stuff like that. And then at first I used to say that we were, we were uh, Bigfoot researchers. And then afterwards I started to learn that because at the time I was going to school and I had a, had a student ID. So after, after, after that experience, I would tell whenever I'd run into a game warden, cause I ended up running into game wardens and I think in uh, Brown Springs, whenever we did some stuff in Brown Springs. So I told them that I was a student and I was writing a paper on deer migration and I was there, there doing soil samples. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the, after a while I got, I got pretty smart. And so that then, the, and then they would leave us alone. But if you say Bigfoot, they're going to, I mean, because I had a game warden just hang out with us the whole time. He didn't leave. He just hung out with us until we packed up and left and then he left. So do I, do I think it's a conspiracy a little bit? I, yeah, I think so. Because I think if you, if you were to prove that there is a Bigfoot like in East Texas, then that, you know, that affects logging and that affects logging and that's, you know, people, you know, it's money in people's pockets and yeah. So yeah, I think, I think so. What are the, some of the, uh, similarities and differences that you've ran across between Bigfoot and the paranormal worlds? You know, I'll say this, that, um, currently right now in the paranormal world, I mean, there's, there's, there's groups on both sides. that are not good people and there's, there's people and there's groups that are not good. And so I tend to find on the paranormal side that there's a little bit more unity than the, <laughs> there is on the Bigfoot side. And I'm sure you're going to back me on this one. So, <laughs> So there's, there's, um, there's like, um, on the paranormal side right now, there's a lot of like unity right now and I, I'm really digging it. And, uh, Pentex is right now is, I just joined, um, part of the paranormal United network. And so they, they've been helping me out on cases on, uh, finding researchers like in West Texas that I, I get cases from West Texas. So I try to help them out. So I reach into the network and the network helps me out with, you know, a, people that are available to go out and investigate. So I couldn't get that in Bigfoot stuff at all. And so, and I hate to be negative about that because I'm not a negative person. I try not to be, but uh, there's, there's a ton of negative stuff in Bigfoot stuff. So, I mean, I mean, most of the stuff that I, I most people that I've dealt with, like the newer people, they're just, they're just not very good. I mean, there's, there's tons of good people but they're not in the open or, or people know about them. Like, you know, coming up, I was, I was helped by Bobby short a lot and I love Bobby short and you know how I feel about her. So mm -hmm. she helped me out a lot. Her website helped me out a lot whenever I first came on. So she was a great person. Um, Eric Altman was a very good person. Cause I think when I came up, he was, he was, you know, the, the director for Pen Pennsylvania Bigfoot Society. And so he was sharing information with me. Rex Gerrard, like I was saying earlier, he was sharing like information with me. So early on when I first got into, to, and then even like whenever I did some stuff with you, you were, you were very helpful to me. So, and I, 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 you know, back then I, I know you were new to it and I was new to it, but I learned a lot from you. So I, I mean, early on it was good. But like the new kids out today now, I don't know. I mean, I hopefully, hopefully, I, if if I get back deep into it, it'll it'll change. I mean, maybe I'll meet some people and then they'll they'll change my perspective on it. But right now, it's just, it's just not it's it's not conducive, you know. And um, I don't see a lot of people helping people on the Bigfoot side. But maybe I'm wrong. So I've thought about this question a lot. I've never talked to you about this subject. Okay. But due to uh, the current climate of the United States, mm -hmm. I thought I would just ask your take on it. Uh, whenever it comes to Bigfoot, it has always been predominantly white male. Yes. You are Hispanic. Yes. Why do you think there aren't hardly any minorities in Bigfoot? And have you ever experienced any sort of racism or bigotry directed at you or someone else in the Bigfoot world? Um, I, you know, I'll say this. I, 
I don't recall. I, I know one time I got shot at, but it was <laughs> it was it was because I was walking on this guy's property and like I. I, I went out to go investigate. This guy had did a sighting report, and I went to go out to go. I don't know if I ever told you that. Did I ever tell you? I that? don't think so. I don't recall a story where you got <laughs> yeah. shot at. Yeah, I was like, it was, I, it was like, it was in Paris, Texas, and it was. Uh, I went out to go. It was like the early years of Paris, and I, I had got a sighting report, so I went on this guy's property, and his 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 house was way off the road, and he had like this gate at the front at the front gate. And I mean, at the, at, at the front road. And so you had to get out of your vehicle, move the gate and then move in and move the gate back then drive in, you know, you know, a hundred yards down. And there was this guy's house. So I was doing that. I was moving the gate. Cause like he had sent in a sighting report. So I went to go to his house to go talk to him and they weren't cell phones back then. So, I mean, I, there were, but I didn't have one. So, um, so I was moving the gate and the guy shot at me. <laughs> I fell on the ground, jumped back up, got in the car, backed out, took off. And he called me later on that day and says, Hey man, I'm sorry. I go, no, I'm not going back out there. So, but, um, but yeah, I don't know why. Uh, cause I know I had a, I, I know I, we've TBRC had a case where it was a African American person that was supposedly picked up by a Bigfoot and slammed down. And then, uh, he, he was in the hospital and we had gone out to go talk to him and his family didn't, wouldn't let us do it. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't let us talk to him and they claimed it was a Panther. And, um, and then there was another incident. I think it was in, I was in Lindau and I was uh, doing a sighting report of a Bigfoot crossing um, electrical right away on this road. And I was walking down the road and I was looking for evidence. And this African American pulled up next to me and asked me if I had broken down, if I was okay. And I said, no, I'm fine. I go, I'm just looking, looking for Bigfoot. And he rolled up his window and laughed and just drove off. So. <laughs> So um, I don't know why there's not that many people because I, I think for the longest time I think other than myself, and I and I don't toot my own my own horn on this and you you know this I think it was me, and I think it was uh, Daniel Perez, and there was a guy in the in uh, Pennsylvania Bigfoot Society were the only Mexicans that were doing Bigfoot research you know openly, because I whenever whenever I was whenever I was doing like. Geo cities. And whenever I was going to the chat rooms, I was, I always gone in as Robert J. Dominguez. I'd never changed my name, you know, to, you know, timber person or, you know, Bigfoot hunter, <laughs> right. or whatever, you know, <laughs> I was always Robert J. Dominguez. I've always, I've always kept that and I never changed. And so I want people to know who I am and I don't, I'm not hiding around anything. So I think for a while, but I don't know why that is because I, I would, I would probably say that minorities get, and this is just from me, from experience it myself, um, people get ridiculed. You get ridiculed like really bad by your family. Cause I know, I, I know I did. I know I had some friends from high school um, that disowned me because I was doing Bigfoot stuff. And I was like, I grew up with these guys, played football with them. And I had, you know, been in fights with them, not, you know, helping them out with fights and stuff. And, and as soon as I started pay, taking on Bigfoot stuff, they just disowned me. And um, I don't know. I mean, I've never experienced any racism while I was researching anywhere. Well, it's something that comes to mind, you know, because yeah. all these years, uh, you know, the number of minorities involved in Bigfoot research do not correlate with the actual population yeah. densities of minorities in the United States. You know, no one's ever asked me that question ever. I think they're probably afraid of it. Yeah, probably. Do you see minorities in paranormal stuff? Yeah, actually, uh, in uh, there's a big surge in San Antonio right now, and there's like lots of groups in San Antonio and Laredo uh, that I'm finding, and they're they're predominantly Hispanic. So I mean, I I don't know, I don't know. I mean, it's right now in Texas, it's just it's just surging like really really high right now. And so, have you ever experienced anything paranormal while you're out bigfooting? You know, there was an incident. I know I talked about it on the podcast once. I was um, I was with uh, Ken Marvel and I think I want to say Tim Clay, and we we're in we we're in again in the Key Michis, and we were we were on um, on Ken's property, and um, he had you know to be on his property, you had the you had to own land there, and so there was like a security guard at the gate, and so not everybody could you know just drive up there and just hang out. So you had to own property and you had to get past the, uh, 
you know, you know, past the guard. And so there was a, there was a day one time we were up there, it was, it was getting dark and it was like already getting, you know, you couldn't see. And uh, we were standing by the campfire just talking and it was like a car coming up the road. And um, there was a, uh, you know, we had thought it was, it was my uh, Ken Marvel's neighbor. So we would go talk to them and we would like, you know, trade um, like wood. Cause this guy had a bunch of wood. He cut up a bunch of wood. So we would take him beer and he would like give us wood. And so for our, the, the, uh, our campfire. And so he was pulling up. I said, Hey, your neighbor's coming. We should go, you know, check him out. And he goes, okay, well let's, let's just walk over there and, and, and just say hi to him. And so as we're walking down the road, uh, we can see like this, this vehicle coming up and um, it was quiet. It wasn't like, oh, that's, it's kind of weird. Cause it, you didn't hear an engine. And as we're getting closer, um, these these two lights stop in the middle of the road and this but it's probably like i don't know a good hundred yards away and then it it notices us and then these lights just take off in the woods and it was like these lights were going through trees what <laughs> going through trees and then it just because like at the very end there at the very end of of ken marvel's property it drops off into a ridge it goes straight down and so these lights just went ran through the woods dodging trees and then went down the ridge and I go, I go, did you see that? And they all said, because, yeah, did you see it? So we went back and we wrote down what we saw and we all compared notes. So it was just weird. And it was a lot, a lot of weird stuff in that area. Do you think so, it was Bigfoot related or something different? I think it was something different. But, you know, um, the thing about, because I know I talked about this on, on my show, that there's, um, to me, I think there's like a, there's like a veil, um, like in, time and stuff and this opens up and there's like a veil that that's open for like bigfoot sightings and paranormal sightings and ufo sightings there's just there's just like a crack there were some areas are more open than others i don't know why but that area in kimichi and moyers it's just open to a lot of stuff i don't know why that's a really interesting take on it yeah um if you could have one question answered about bigfoot right now mm-hmm. what would it be um i would probably say that uh if that was really patty walking across the bluff creek that that really was a patty i mean if it really was a female and where was she going <laughs> <laughs> that that's interesting that that's your answer because <laughs> i've been asked the question if you had the ability to time travel, yeah, where's the first place you would go? Bluff and my Creek. answer is Bluff Creek. Oh my God. At that exact moment <laughs> to find out for myself. <laughs> I would be on the other side where she's walking to, you know? Like, ha! <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's amazing. That's, that's, well, that's, it shows, you know, how we're, we kind of marry each other's thoughts and, yeah, and how obsessed with Bigfoot we are. Yeah, that's true. So anybody that thinks they see a second Bigfoot in the Patterson film, that's really me. Yeah. <laughs> or that's Bob. <laughs> it's just Matt or Bob. It's Bob. We're just hanging out. Hanging out by the log. Okay, so before I let you go, uh huh. I want to do a lightning round. Okay, go. Of Bigfoot FAQs. Okay. Do, uh, everyone... do, I, have to an- do I have to answer quick? Uh, yeah, kind of. I mean, you know, that's why it's called a lightning round. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. With everyone having cameras on their phones, why aren't there pictures and video? Um, people are slow. Where are the bones slash bodies at? Uh, they get scattered in the woods because you never find like a bones of a grizzly bear. So they get scavenged. Could it all just be a hoax? No. What do they eat? They eat grasshoppers. <laughs> <laughs> How do they stay hidden? Um, they find big rock ridges in the Moyers, Oklahoma. Where is the physical evidence? Uh, it's at Bluff Creek. How many Bigfoot are there? Two. <laughs> do they climb trees? Yes. I've 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 actually seen video, not video, but I've heard audio of that. Shouldn't we just leave them alone? 
We probably should. Are we? No. What are they? I always call them. I always call them locals because they've been here a lot longer than we have. Good answers. Thanks, man. Thank <laughs> you for joining me on this first episode of Bigfoot Crossroads Podcast. Man, I am excited that I'm your very first guest in this new format. I really Matt. appreciate it. It's awesome. <laughs> Thank uh, you, sir. It's kind of funny. You know, this isn't the first time I've interviewed you over the years for something, yeah. but this is definitely the funnest I've ever had interviewing you. Yeah. I, I want to say this is probably the most, I mean, um, I think on our our podcast, we interviewed, we, we laughed a lot and I think I had a good time, but I think I, I had more fun with this one. And your podcast is Bigfoot Club. Bigfoot Club. Uh, we're on all the we're on all the platforms, so you could check us out there. And uh, if they like, want to reach out to you, they can reach out to me. They could either reach out to me on uh, Facebook. We're at Bigfoot Club, the number one, on Facebook page, or they can uh, go to Twitter. At, we're at Bigfoot Club, the number one as well. And if they want to email me, they can email me at Bigfoot Club. The, the number one at gmail.com so so bigfoot club one everywhere everywhere and you're on itunes stitcher uh, spotify uh we're on itunes stitcher spotify uh iheart pandora um uh we're on youtube uh we're on um google play uh we're on um alexa as well alexa yeah you can say alexa play bigfoot club podcast and it plays it that's awesome yes sir it is and you're awesome i appreciate you man i appreciate you bob dominguez bigfoot slash ghost hunter extraordinaire Be sure to check out my other podcast, Planet Fear, where myself and Lauren Smith talk about all the fearful and frightening things out there, from encounters with the paranormal to stories of true crime. Go to planetfearpodcast.com for new episodes and links to all the places you can find us.